You know how the best jokes are the ones where you tell people what the punchline is near the beginning and then keep telling the rest of the joke anyway? No? That's... Well, then never mind. This is a review of the Star Trek Enterprise episode Shuttle Pod 1. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know what happens in it, be warned. Spoilers beyond this point. It's theater at its most fundamental. It's drama at its most gripping. It's two men trapped on a tiny ship, adrift among the stars with no hope of rescue, except for the rescue that we are repeatedly shown is coming. I can't take the suspense! Commander Trip Tucker and Lieutenant Malcolm Reed are aboard Shuttle Pod 1, making their way through an asteroid field, waiting for Enterprise to come pick them up. They're a few days early for the rendezvous, so Malcolm is about to curl up with his copy of Ulysses while Tucker continues his attempts to repair the shuttle's mysteriously malfunctioning sensors and communication system. They're engaging in some good-natured ribbing of the sort to which astronauts such as themselves are so typically and delightfully prone. Reed boasts of the superiority of the British education system and accuses American Tucker of only having read comic books. Tucker responds by defending the subtextual complexity of Superman and so on, but... Their joviality is interrupted by a startling discovery. As they pass over one of the larger asteroids, Reed notices some wreckage. They fly in for a closer look, and the wreckage is from Enterprise. Oh my god, their humble shuttle pod has just transformed from a vehicle to a tomb. They're doomed. All their crewmates... Their friends are dead. Their mothership, the mighty and majestic Enterprise, has been destroyed. What are they going to do? How can they... Wait, never mind. As soon as the opening credits are over, there's Enterprise. It's fine. They're fine. Everyone's fine. They had to rescue some aliens, and an accident during the docking procedure just knocked off one of the ship's doors. That's what that wreckage was on the asteroid. It's okay. We're four minutes into the episode. Everybody's fine. It's going to be fine. Meanwhile, on the shuttle pod, Trip and Malcolm are trying to problem-solve their way out of what they wrongly believe to be their desperate situation. The shuttle pod's scanners and comms are down, so navigation is challenging, but Malcolm thinks that big blue star looks familiar, so he uses that to set a course that he thinks might take them in the general direction of a nearby relay station, which could boost their distress call far enough that someone might actually hear it. The only problem with that is... They don't have enough oxygen left to survive the journey. Still, it's the best chance they've got, so Trip orders Malcolm to set a course. We begin to see the contrasting points of view held by the two men. Malcolm is a cold, logical realist. He accepts the inevitability of their fate. They don't have enough air left. They're too far away from any place where people are. The odds of a ship happening to pass close enough to see them are literally astronomical. So, he chooses to spend his final days recording a personal log, documenting how they and the rest of the Enterprise crew came to meet their end for the benefit of whoever eventually recovers the shuttle pod and their frozen corpses. Trip, on the other hand, is a stubborn optimist. He chooses to focus on the possibilities. Think of how many spacefaring species there are. Vulcans, Klingons, Andorians, Martians... Those guys from Plan 9 from Outer Space, any one of them could have a ship nearby. Trip has no time for recording farewells and final testaments. He's got work to do on those sensors. They eat. They argue. Malcolm stays up long into the night recording letters to his family while Trip is trying to sleep. Finally, Malcolm goes to sleep too and wakes up to find that they've been rescued. He comes to in sickbay aboard the Enterprise. There's Dr. Phlox and Captain Archer. They're telling him he's going to be okay. And there's T'Pol, and she seems weirdly into him. She says she's impressed by his courage, and she tells him she likes his name, and she smiles at his jokes about wanting to change his name to Stinky, and just generally acts the way you act around someone when you're definitely thinking about kissing them where they pee. It's all a dream, of course. Malcolm wakes up to find Trip working on the shuttle pod's communicator and wondering who Stinky is. Apparently, Malcolm talks in his sleep. You were calling for some guy named Stinky, Trip says. 
If I didn't know any better, I'd say you wanted to kiss him where he pees. Trip has managed to partially repair the communicator. They can't send messages, but they can receive, though at the moment all they're receiving is white noise. The sound of the galaxy laughing at us, as Trip calls it. Just then, the shuttle is rocked by a collision with something, and the cabin springs a leak. Two leaks, actually, which they manage to patch, first with some leftover mashed potatoes from Tripp's dinner last night, then with a tube of valve sealant, which will probably last about as long as the mashed potatoes would have. Whatever collided with the ship to create those tiny holes must not have been an asteroid, or else the hull would have deflected it. Thanks to the leak, they now have even less air left. They reminisce about going to the 602 Club back when they were in Starfleet training, discover, to their amusement, that they both had sex with the same waitress, decide to lower the temperature to below freezing because Trip thinks that will give them another half day of air, and argue about whether or not it's worth it to shave before they die. Sure seems like a grim situation our heroes are stuck in. I wonder how... Oh yeah, don't forget, Enterprise is fine and on its way to the rescue. T'Pol even has a possible explanation for what that thing was that collided with the shuttle pod. A micro-singularity. A teeny tiny little black hole. Apparently, they damaged that alien ship Enterprise rescued, and also impacted Enterprise's hull in a few spots. Vulcans have theorized about their existence for years, but this is the first evidence that micro-singularities actually exist. Even so, T'Pol agrees with Archer that they should contact the shuttle pod and arrange a new rendezvous point so they can get their people out of harm's way as soon as possible. Back on the shuttle pod, things are looking grim. Malcolm has been recording messages to a series of ex-girlfriends explaining to Trip that none of those relationships worked out because he just could never get close to anyone. He was never even close with his own family. But the Enterprise crew, he was just starting to get comfortable with them. Trip digs out a bottle of bourbon from a storage chest and they drink a toast to the brave men and women of the Starship Enterprise. We cut to a little while later and the two of them are freezing, but nicely toasted. And Malcolm turns to Trip and says, What do you think it's a Paul? Do you think she's pretty? Because I think she's a right firecracker she is. What are you trying to do, Arthur? Is this your Dudley Moore? All I'm saying is I fancy to Paul. She's a woman, and I think she's got a nice bum. Have you ever noticed a bum? What? To Paul's got a magnificent bum. I hate it when the writers just put their own thoughts directly into the characters' mouths, you know? Anyway, Tripp says, no, I've never noticed. I'm not attracted to to Paul, and I never will be. The communicator crackles to life. They rush to the forward control console. Trip dials it in, and it's Hoshi. It's Enterprise! They're alive! Oh, what a joyous surprise that might have been if we hadn't known it since the second scene in the episode! But they're not saved yet. Hoshi is transmitting new coordinates for a rendezvous in two days. They don't have two days of air left. And they can only receive transmissions. They can't send Enterprise a message to get here sooner. They're still gonna die. Unless they can somehow attract Enterprise's attention. As a last-ditch effort to save themselves, they jettison the shuttle pod's impulse engine and blow it up, hoping that will convince Captain Archer to haul ass to their position at top speed. While they wait, they get drunker and colder. They have ten hours of air left now. Tripp decides he's going to sacrifice himself to give Malcolm more of a chance to live until Enterprise gets there and tries to climb out through the airlock, but Malcolm forces him back inside at gunpoint. They've made it this far together. Now either they both live, or they both die. They both live. Malcolm wakes up in sickbay, for real this time, and learns they passed out due to hypothermia and were rescued with only a few hours of air left. Trip is in the next bed over, still unconscious, but he's going to be fine. Malcolm tries to get something started with T'Pol, as in his dream, but she's like, I don't know what you're thinking, but you need to stop thinking it right now. And no checking out my magnificent bum on my way out, either. She leaves. Malcolm says something to the unconscious Trip, calling him my friend. And that's it. The end. So, can you guess what my problem is with this episode? Actually, because it should be fairly obvious from the summary what my problem is, let me start with the good stuff, because there's a lot of it. Everything in the shuttle pod is rock solid. 
The premise is a classic Lost at Sea scenario, Trip and Malcolm adrift with dwindling air and food, no sensors or communications, and on top of that, Enterprise has been destroyed, so there's no hope of rescue. Talk about putting your characters in jeopardy. And then, from that already perilous starting point, the episode steadily intensifies the danger Trip and Malcolm face. The hull of the ship is ruptured, and they need to repair it in a hurry. They realize they're being bombarded by invisible objects capable of doing serious damage. They lose an oxygen tank, cutting their air supply down even lower than it already was. They have to lower the temperature in the cabin, causing them to freeze, and their final act is the ultimate all-or-nothing move. They blow up their own engine, hoping to attract attention. If it works, they're saved. If it doesn't work, their ship is totally out of their control, and their deaths are even more certain than they were before. It's a strong premise, the dilemma is well established and escalated in just the right ways at just the right times, the desperation of the characters comes across, and the interactions between Trip and Malcolm are excellent. They're conflicting personalities. Trip, the never-say-die optimist, Malcolm, the tight-jawed realist, create a natural ebb and flow to their conversations. They argue, they let their guards down and bond, they argue some more, they bond some more, and it all feels genuine in the moment, despite how obviously contrived the underlying situation is. The episode also takes advantage of the premise of the series. Enterprise is set earlier than previous Star Trek shows, and one consequence of this is how much smaller the ships are. The shuttle pod, where Trip and Malcolm spend almost the entire hour, isn't a relatively spacious, multi-roomed TNG-era runabout. It's a close, claustrophobic vessel that feels much closer to an actual spacecraft. Yes, even the shuttle pod is roomier than a real 20th or 21st century NASA vessel would be, but it's much closer to reality than a ship on another Star Trek series would be, with its single undivided space, its myriad hidden storage compartments, and its control switches mounted on seemingly every surface in the forward cockpit section. That closeness, that claustrophobia, reinforces the isolation of the characters as well as the conflict between them when it arises. It works. The plot works, the set design works, the character stuff works, the acting from Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating is strong. It's not at all-time best episode level, but it's good. Even very good. How to account, then? for an episode this well-written in the ways I've just described, making such a basic yet catastrophic mistake as this one makes after the opening credits. The teaser ends with Trip and Malcolm discovering wreckage on an asteroid, indicating Enterprise has been destroyed. Their ride isn't coming. Their shipmates are dead. They are stranded. And all that tension lasts until right after the first commercial break. The first shot after the opening credits is of the Enterprise, fully intact. The title plate is the shot of the Enterprise. The title of the episode is Shuttle Pod 1, and that title is shown over a shot of the Enterprise. Is there a more perfect visualization of what's wrong with this episode? We all know they're going to be fine anyway. It's an episode in a series called Enterprise. We know intellectually when they discover the wreckage on the asteroid that it's going to turn out Enterprise is okay in the end. But that doesn't mean the story couldn't still have drawn us in, gotten us invested in Trip and Malcolm's perspective. As far as they know, Enterprise has been destroyed. So even though we in the audience would assume that Enterprise is actually fine, Trip and Malcolm having that belief and being in that headspace could still make for some really effective dramatic tension. Instead, the writers of the episode, series creators Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, decide to release all that tension right away by showing us explicitly that Enterprise and everyone aboard it are fine and immediately explaining what the wreckage Trip and Malcolm saw was, and even providing an explanation for what damaged the shuttle pod. We know so much more about Trip and Malcolm's situation than they do. Isn't it great watching characters try to solve problems you already know the solution to, and struggling to deal with a crisis you already know is going to come to a happy conclusion? There is no reason for us to see Enterprise or any other member of the crew at all 
other than Malcolm's dream scene and the ending. The whole bit of them being stuck in the shuttle depends on us being immersed in their perspective. As far as they know, they're stuck. As far as they know, they don't have help coming. As far as they know, all their friends are dead and their ship is gone. Letting us see that Enterprise is okay and help is on the way long before Trip and Malcolm know it is not only counterproductive to the success of this story, it's fatal. You can't even make the argument that the Enterprise scenes were added to pad out the runtime because the two non-dream scenes set aboard Enterprise before the ending add up to, what, maybe two minutes in total? Alfred Hitchcock made a whole ass 90 minute movie set aboard a lifeboat floating in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm pretty sure even Rick Berman could have come up with two more minutes worth of shit for Trip and Malcolm to do on that shuttle pod instead of cutting to Archer's ready room. The worst part is, the late turn of Enterprise contacting them could have worked so well. They spend the whole episode up to that point believing their ship is gone and their crew is dead, and then, in their most desperate hour, a miracle! Enterprise is fine, their friends are on their way, but then, that final sharp twist of the knife, Enterprise is on the way, but it won't make it in time. And there's no way for Tripp and Malcolm to tell them to hurry up. The emotional ups and downs of that. Our friends are alive. Help is on the way. It won't get here in time. Are just... Or they would be if the episode hadn't already shot itself in the foot by telling us Enterprise was okay all along. I think maybe they were going for dramatic irony. Tripp and Malcolm think the Enterprise is gone, but we know it's not. But in this case, dramatic irony isn't very dramatic. Not only does it blow out all the possible tension from the story, it also makes Trip and Malcolm into fools. They spend the whole episode thinking they're going to die when we know all along that they're not. And not just because we assume some sort of rescue is coming due to this being an episode in an ongoing series, but because this episode has explicitly told us their friends are alive and everything is going to be fine. How are we supposed to identify with them and sympathize with them when we know their fears are unfounded and everything is going to be fine? Hell, even with the unavoidable presumption that Enterprise is fine and their rescue is imminent because that's how episodic television works most of the time, there could still have been some minor intrigue as to the details. What did really happen to the Enterprise? Where did that wreckage on the asteroid come from? What was the cause of the shuttle pod's damage? We don't even get that, though. All those questions are answered definitively long before the end of the episode. Most of them right after the opening credits. It's just... <laughs> It's baffling. It's inexplicable to me how this episode, written by two guys who each had more than a decade of experience working in television by this point, shoots itself in the foot. Neither Berman nor Braga are what I would call great writers, but this is something a first-year writing student should know. This isn't some subtle point of story structure that you would expect to go unnoticed by anything other than a close critical analysis. This is basic shit. If you put your characters in a tense situation and you're going to leave them in that tense situation all the way through, don't diffuse the tension for your audience a few minutes in. Because everything after that, no matter how well executed it might be, is going to be pointless. Cut out the scene set aboard the Enterprise, maintain focus on Trip and Malcolm in the shuttle pod, and you'd have yourself a fine episode. Unfortunately, that is not an option, because in this context, I'm a critic, not an editor. Those are my thoughts on ShuttlePod 1. What do you think of this episode? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would, if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash steveshives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button, or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. That's it for this batch of bottle episodes. I know there are lots more Star Trek bottle episodes, and I'm sure I'll get around to doing another batch at some point, but I think that's quite enough of this theme for now. Next week, I begin a new batch of reviews, and the theme for that one is Worst Episodes Ever. 
then where else could we possibly begin there than with the quintessential worst episode ever, the episode that, for a few decades at least, epitomized Star Trek at its lousiest. I'm talking about an episode of Star Trek the original series titled Spock's Brain. See you then, thanks for watching, and take care everybody.